Splatoon 3 has been announced and there is a lot of ground to cover. So you know what that means. It's time to grab our splatter shots and head to a turf war. Wait, no, not that kind of ground to cover. <clears throat> it's time to ink up the old analysis machine to see what secrets and hidden details we can find. Before we start, I want to give a very special shout out to two close friends of mine, TJ Lockings and PSI Kid T on Twitter, for helping me find everything to go over in this analysis. It's a long one. With that out of the way, let's dive in. Between the reveal trailer and a thread of information posted on Twitter, it's safe to say that we're not in Inkopolis anymore. Splatoon 3 takes place in a new Inkling and Octoling habitat, a city called Splatsville, also known as the City of Chaos. Huh. Guess that last Splatfest of Chaos vs. Order, the Final Fest Splatocalypse, was pretty important after all. Spotsville is located in the greater location of the Splatlands, a barren, desert-like wasteland littered with the ruined remains of a society long gone. Outside of the city are oil barrels, cars, trains, and other structures that lay in ruin. While Chaos won the final Splatfest of Splatoon 2, I think it's safe to say that these are not the remains of some modern society and are more than likely the remains of the apocalypse that brought the downfall of humanity, as teased in lore you can find throughout Splatoon 1 and 2. Plus, let's not forget to mention the giant ruined remains of the Eiffel Tower in this crater. And yes, it's specifically the Eiffel Tower, as the architecture actually matches up. The question is, how did it get here? And why is it upside down? It seems unlikely that the tower simply flipped over, so, maybe the Eiffel Tower was launched from its original location and ended up here, landing upside down like a large missile, creating this crater. Interestingly, it's not the only thing in this crater. We can see some sort of tower peeking out from behind the fencing, looking a bit like a watchtower or a crow's nest of a ship. Beyond the remains of human society, we can also see the crater is fenced off using makeshift materials, mostly various pipes, metal panels, and cloths. Caution tape helps hold this together, notably using the squid language, so it's safe to say modern society built this fencing. There's also some sort of gate up ahead. After the character creation here in the Splatlands, the Inkling moves away from the ruins and heads towards the gate, most likely towards the train station. Speaking of the train station, it looks about the condition you'd expect found in the Splatlands. The roofing is falling apart, as are some of the chairs. The mailbox on the left is crooked, and tumbleweeds are, well, tumbling. The train tracks stretch far back and curve to the left, as do the telephone poles running parallel. And there's an additional line of tracks to the left, following the same path as the telephone poles and the main tracks. But the train station only seems to face one direction. Could there be another for the other set? We can't help but wonder if this implies you'll be able to revisit this area later. In addition, the pole near the station has a light on it, shedding some light in the dark. Could we possibly revisit here at night too? implying this may be more than just the beginning tutorial section? Well, more on that later. In the background on the left, we can see Splatsville, and we get a similar look while riding the train, just before the screen fades to white. Let's back up a little though to talk about this train. It's a bit different from the subways found in Splatoon 2's auto expansion. This train also seems a bit run down. One of the handles up top is snapped. The other passengers also seem pretty tired, this jellyfish in the white tank top is leaned back and looks to just be waiting for the ride to end, while this large fish in the grey tank top closer to the camera is a bit out of focus, just minding his own business. The player sits on the right, keeping to themselves, while the little buddy Salmonid bounces around excitedly. Actually, let's talk about little buddy, because we haven't yet. This small fry Salmonid accompanies the player from the very moment your character is created out in the Splatlands, this time as an ally. While the small fries were weak enemies in Splatoon 2 Salmon Run mode, they could jump to incredible heights, and having one here as an ally is pretty unexpected. Why are these two working together? On Twitter, it's been said that how this seemingly symbiotic relationship evolved is a thrilling mystery, adding to the idea that this partnership might be important. But what can this little buddy small fry do for the player? Maybe it functions as an ally, similar to Bowser Jr. in the recently released Bowser's Fury, assisting the player finding secrets and attacking enemies. We don't see the Salmonid in Splatsville, though it could simply be out of frame, since it seems to lag behind the player a bit going off of the gameplay. We know it accompanies the player to the city since it sits on the train. Maybe it stays at the train station, the player's cue to enter story mode? Also, my biggest question, can we name Little Buddy? Something else I'm curious about is what the player is holding in this bag. It's not the ink tank, as we can see the red light from it still on the player's back. Well, it could be their weapon, since we see them wielding the bow before getting on the train, 
We also see them without the bow in the Splatlands, and no accompanying bag. So, what's in the bag? Well, more on that later. For now, let's get off this train and enter Splatsville. Right away, one of the first things we can see about Splatsville are the high-rise, East Asian-style apartment buildings all over the place. Air conditioners outside many windows, and clothing hanging out to dry. These apartments all look small, and made me wonder what they look like on the inside. Maybe like the splash screen of the original Splatoon on the Wii U? What if we get an apartment to customize? Okay, that's getting a bit too far into speculation, but the player holding a bag on the train makes me wonder if we're moving into town. If we look up, we can see what looks to be a platform for a train or monorail running through town, with big green metal beams holding it up from the ground. There's plenty of signs and brands for different stores found all around Splatsville, such as this kelp-like brand, a fragile sign that's reminiscent of a shark, a squid-like arrow, various neon signs, a paper airplane by a post office, a large pig acting more like a landmark than a sign, an eye over a rainbow, likely for glasses or a contact lens shop, a sign that looks more like stacked bowls, a moped shop, ammonites, and a hat shop. Bonus points for the top hat being made out of some sort of shell. Some signs are even repeated, pointing towards a street they can be found on. There's a lot more than just these signs, but they're the ones that stood out the most to me. Let's get a little more detailed with some of them. The post office, with a mailbox nearby, likely serves the same purpose as in Splatoon 2, allowing an in-game posting service similar to Miiverse. Ammonites, the weapon shop, once again makes a comeback. The big question is if it's still run by Sheldon. Splatoon 1 and 2 were both in Inkopolis, but Spotsville is an entirely different region. Upstairs from the weapon shop is the hat shop. We can even see some hats on display out on the balcony. There's an open door from the balcony, so the shops might actually be combined this time around. At the moment, no sign of the footwear or shirt stores, but perhaps they're part of the same building. On top of this large building is a giant snake, wearing a very fancy crown. It's really eye-catching, but I don't think this actually may mean too much. Splatoon 2 featured a giant turtle on top of a building, and a large paper crane on another. While it may seem like an odd cultural design, it draws attention to the buildings they're on. Moving on from the shops and storefronts, let's talk about Splatsville as a city. It's definitely on the more crowded side than the past few hubs in Inkopolis. There's traffic lights and street signs, cars nearby, trucks, planes flying overhead, cranes atop the tall buildings, busy streets, and alleyways. Behind the large pig sign is a small alleyway with Chinese lanterns. The building on the left looks like it may be enterable. Also, up the stairs in the back is an odd purple light, though what it could be, we have no idea. One of the biggest points of the city we've yet to talk about is the main multiplayer tower, looking very similar to the appearances in the previous games. A tall tower with a direct path leading up to it, flashing colors, and the same logo? Yeah, this is the main place to go to for your multiplayer matches. To the left is a large structure, which I think actually acts as a gateway to the city. We can also see a train station sign on the lower left, or at least a path leading to one. While this is likely indicative of the train the player arrived on, I wonder if this may hint to a subway system similar to Splatoon 2's Octo expansion. Speaking of the Octo expansion, this is a great time to think about the single player content of Splatoon 3. And, well, we don't know too much about it, but the whole section in the Splatlands leading up to Splatsville is more than likely the opening tutorial that's a staple to the series now since it began with the character creation. Unlike the previous entries, where the starting area could never be returned to, the Splatlands seem more accessible with this train ride to town, instead of a cannon. The accessibility makes it seem easy to return to, and the light may mean one can return at night, so perhaps this really is more than just a tutorial section. That being said, the amount of emphasis on this new land leads me to confidently believe that the single-player story of this game is very likely focused on exploring it learning the secrets and lore to it all. Once again, since this new land is mostly separate from Inkopolis, players should get ready to expect a whole new cast of characters. Of course, we know that the development of Splatsville, the City of Chaos, had its development heavily accelerated after the result of the Final Fest Splatocalypse, so it's entirely possible there may be some connections. The Splatlands aren't limited to just the introduction of the game, but also to the multiplayer. Our first glimpse at a turf war in Splatoon 3 actually took place in the surrounding area, built up on wooden and metal structures. The battlefield we saw looked much more like a post-apocalyptic fort, built up from scraps and meant to look imposing in this wasteland. The large fish bones and fossils, whether real or simply decorations, are definitely enough to strike some fear into enemy inklings. Interestingly, it also looks like an unfinished construction site. 
the original spawn for the battlefield is closed off and unused. Just behind the closed spawn, we can see some paintings that seem to be either old and fading, or simply unfinished. Given the makeshift nature of this entire battlefield, these might have been part of random wood panels used to build the walls, or perhaps the workers took some time to paint them in their off time. It's a neat little detail that helps this level feel like it was actually constructed by people. If the spawn is closed off, how did the Inklings and Octolinks spawn into battle? These flying coffee maker drones, of course. Each player spawns in one, or hanging from one, before going back inside and launching into battle at the exact point they target. But choose quickly, as is the timer, as indicated by the ring around the cursor getting smaller, before actually launching the players. As players take aim at the battlefield, your teammates' cursors can be seen as well. The smooth movement to it all leads me to believe this is likely done using motion controls. This is not only an exciting addition, it should also help combat against spawn kills, since you can just avoid any nearby opponents. Unfortunately, the exact limitations of the launch from spawn drones aren't known, so it's hard to say if you can launch yourself much further than we see here. As players spawn in, they each take a different pose, depending on the weapon type they're using. The Splattershot and Point 96 Gal users both strike the same pose in their spawns. The Gold Dynamo Roller user stands with the roller over their shoulder. The Blaster stands with a slight slant on their spawner. The Hydra Splatling user balances their spawner straight while they lean back to hold their heavy weapon. The Sloshing Machine user also keeps their spawner straight while they hunch forward. And the E-Leader with a scope, a charger, doesn't even stand on their spawner, but holds on to a single handle. These Inklings and Otherlings are all about living on the edge, aren't they? The player seen throughout the entire trailer stands with a slight diagonal slant to the spawner, holding their bow horizontally. Let's talk a bit about this new bow weapon before getting into the main gameplay. Visually, it's a wooden bow with metal attachments, especially for the ink tank. The string and main functionality of the bow is made of ink. There's a handle to pull back on the main tank, just as you would knock an arrow. The string leads to two further nozzles, above and below the main tank. A cylindrical metal object in front attached to the bow not only looks like it holds the main ink tank in place, but also wraps up the ink string, almost like a fishing rod. When the bow is fired, it fires three shots of ink. When held vertically, it seems the top nozzle fires the furthest, with the shots from the bow covering a thin, yet long range, in the similar fashion to a charger weapon. The few times we see the bow fired in the trailer, the inkling is mid-jump. We can actually see the bow held horizontally if we slow down this one clip but the Inkling jumps before firing. What if the bow actually changes orientation based on if the player is in the air or on the ground, firing vertically in the air and horizontally on the ground? Horizontal shots from the bow would be far wider, but definitely not as long in the range. If this is how the bow functions, it might actually be a really interesting new weapon type. It's unlikely, but what if the player could actually change the orientation of the bow using motion controls? It'd be difficult to combine with motion-based aiming, but I'm very interested in this new bow weapon. Now, let's talk about the Turf War gameplay. For the most part, it's functionally the same as the past few games. Inklings and Otterlings work in teams of four to cover as much of the battlefield in their color as they can in the time frame. There's a few new moves that the players will be able to use. The Squid Roll, which is a new sort of spin jump for quick dodging, and the Squid Surge, which is a new jump after climbing a wall, allowing for a nice aerial ambush. Though we don't get to see too much of them in the trailer, let's explore what we know of the specials and sub-weapons. The Ink Zooka is back with a redesign after missing Splatoon 2, and seems to be tied to both the new bow and the splatter shot. Unlike before, where it shot out pillars of ink, it now shoots out three blobs of ink at a time in bursts. The next one we don't see directly in the trailer, but in a screenshot on Twitter. A series of small machines create a dangerous beam shooting through the battlefield, almost like small versions of the killer whale. We can see it in use by the purple team in the trailer, but not the direct source of the attack. Next up is the new little crab turret. We don't know exactly what it will do, but it's thrown in ball form, before opening up revealing three turrets, and uses the ball's frames as its legs. Perhaps it keeps firing shots of ink forward while moving to the left and right? A screenshot from Twitter showcasing the ink Zuka might also give us a look at another returning special weapon. These yellow projectiles in the air on the left might mean the return of Tenta missiles. Okay, we're almost done here, but there's a few additional things I want to touch on before we start wrapping up. First off, the ink tank. Now no longer like a cylindrical thermos on the Inkling's back, the ink tank looks more like a water bottle or water canteen. Its shape is also a bit different, now looking more comfortable to wear against the back, while also being a bit less bulky. It should still hold the same amount of ink, though. Next, it was confirmed on Twitter that many weapons have been redesigned to fit this different culture, while sub and special weapons have been reconfigured from their Inkopolis counterparts. 
it's safe to say that while Splatoon 3 may bring back a lot of mechanics and features found in Splatoon 2, they're very likely not to be identical. This is going to be a very different game, both visually and mechanically. Speaking of visually, I'm sure many of you have been waiting for it. So let's get into the customization features. There's a lot to go over here, so I wanted to save this for last. This time around, the character creator is fully integrated within the world, instead of simply a menu. We had a sense of this with the Octo expansion in Splatoon 2, so perhaps this hints at a greater focus on the story and world than we've seen before? The customization is much less restrictive than in previous entries in the series. We did a little video about Splatoon 3 dropping gender-specific customization, though it's a bit bigger than that. In previous entries in the series, players were limited to Inkling Girl, Inkling Boy, Octoling Boy, and Octoling Girl, each with their own hairstyles locked to those forms. This time around, they're labeled solely as styles, and serve more as a base for the character creator, with no further customization locked behind your pick. Well, Octolings can only have Octoling hairstyles, and Inklings can only have Inkling hairstyles, but I think that makes perfect sense. Beyond that, anything goes. These bases still likely have some differences between them like prior games, namely the eyebrows from what we can see here, though this will likely affect the voice and animations as well. After selecting your style, the character takes off their mask to reveal more of the face for skin tone selection. There are now 9 different skin tones to choose from, two more than in Splatoon 2. Once that's chosen, the character removes their glasses to show off their eyes, for the eye color selection. While Splatoon 2 had 14 different eye colors, Splatoon 3 offers a whopping 21 options, and introduces 3 toned colored eyes. The top left color is the iris, while the main eye color takes up the rest of the icon, and for 3 tones, the lower right makes up an outer ring around the eye. The player actually chooses one of these, and we can see the faint orange ring around the eye, almost working as a gradient into the rest of the main eye color. There's some fancy selections here, and I'm definitely interested in seeing them all. The quick glimpse we have at this black to purple to green catches my eye, no pun intended, but only because I like the colors. This one on the far right might be pretty neat, if it makes the iris a bright red. Once the eyes are set, the inkling pulls down their hood to reveal more of their hair, leading us into hairstyles. There's four new inkling hairstyles, each of which we get a nice look at here. Past those four, we see the default hairstyles from the first Splatoon, and a hint of one of the default hairstyles from Splatoon 2. Splatoon 2 offered six hairstyles for each inkling, so if that's combined with the four new ones, that means inklings have a whopping 16 hairstyle options, if all of them come back. The thing is, it seems likely. We see a couple inklings in the trailer with what may be the banger style, and the pigtail style. That leaves about six inkling hairstyles yet to be seen from Splatoon 2, though I have a feeling we'll be seeing them come back. As for Octolings, we can see the two default hairstyles from the style select screen, both sporting long hair options. We may even be able to see both of these in-game, the first by this Octoling using the Hydra Splatling, and the second by this Octoling with the red headphones. The shape of the hair nearly matches, and they have the thicker eyebrows, making them a bit easier to compare to the default style option. We can also see them from the back, which gives us a better look at this hairstyle. In addition to these two default Octoling hairstyles, we can also see two more in-game, a pompadour style, and another with the hair up and a buzzed fade around the back of the head. That makes four new Octoling hairstyles, the same amount as new Inkling hairstyles. So if the four options from Splatoon 2 come back, that makes for eight total for the Octolings. Would an additional eight be added to bring the count up to an equal 16 to the Inkling options? It's certainly possible, but I don't think so. The Octolings had less options than the Inklings in Splatoon 2, so it wouldn't be surprising to see the same happen here, especially when the majority of options for Inklings are returning from previous entries. Both species have the same number of new hairstyles. Once the hair is set, the inkling stands up, tossing off the tattered cloak for the legwear section. There's 9 options, one less of the 10 found in Splatoon 2. Option 3 is brand new, so this means that 2 legwear options from Splatoon 2 aren't available in this third game. That being said, there's no restrictions on the legwear. Your character can wear shorts, tights, pants, or a skirt. That's everything on the starting character creator customization. But that's not all you can do. Splatoon as a series is known for a large variety of outfits that the player can wear to keep their looks fresh and stylish. There's quite a lot from the reveal of Splatoon 3, but a fair amount are returning from previous games. The golf visor, the fugu bell hat, studio headphones, short beanie, b-ball jersey, shirt and tie, camo layered LS, camo zip hoodie, zeko long carrot tee, 
King jersey, red fish fry sandals, SV925 circle shades, red hula punk with tie, punk cherries, anarchy yellow cuff, a knitted hat, safari hat, amber sea slug high tops, choco clogs, snowy down boots, tea green hunting boots, turquoise kicks, and the anarchy mask. Plus, we can see the main player Inkling isn't wearing any sort of headgear here, which normally only can be done by wearing fake contacts. So, those are likely back too. Whew, that's a lot of returning clothing. And it's safe to say, that's not even most of it. Luckily, it's not all old styles. How else would the denizens of Splatsville stay fresh? Let's take a look at some of the new clothing options next. First up, maybe an obvious one. The main player Inkling seen throughout the trailer. They're wearing an old, tattered shirt, and some grey boots sporting some black and red. Next up is this Inkling holding onto the spawn drone. They've got purple and yellow sandals, a colorful button-up shirt that's primarily orange or purple, and a black hat. The third player, the first Otterling of the team, sports black and yellow sandals, and a matching jacket that also includes some purple. They wear a yellow mask over their mouth. Finally, for this first team, the fourth player is another Octoling, wearing red sneakers and a red vest over a dark blue shirt with long red sleeves. Their headgear is a pair of white goggles with yellow lenses. Moving on to the other team, this first Octoling has red headphones, teal shoes, and a white button-up shirt. During a close-up shot, we can see this shirt has a pattern running down both sides, and plenty of buttoned pockets. The next Octoling has white boots, a gray shirt with a brown vest, and a striped helmet. The helmet stripes change based on the team color, as during the little character spotlight, we see this Octoling is now on the yellow team, and the helmet stripes change to match. The third player, this Inkling, wears red shoes with black straps, and a dark gray sweater that looks a bit too big for them. On their head, they have 8-bit glasses. Finally, this Inkling in the back has some dark shoes with red highlights, and a green sports jersey over a white t-shirt. There's a chain necklace with some sort of timer attached to it, likely tied to the shirt. They wear a viking helmet, with squid-shaped decor coming down the sides. This was only a tease of the new clothing coming to Splatoon 3, and I'm sure everyone is excited to see what else we may get. Okay, we're just about done here, but the last thing I want to bring up is Little Buddy once again. This little small fry salmonid also gets a customization spotlight in the opening, where you get to choose its hairstyles. We don't see all 7 options shown off, but it looks like there were only 7 to choose from. The ability to customize Little Buddy has me wondering though, does this imply other players may be able to see and possibly interact with it? Why else would we be able to choose a look for this small fry, if not to be able to differentiate it from others and add some personal flair? What if Little Buddy works like a small following companion that can be found in online menus, lobbies, and more? Basically, anywhere that isn't part of Turf Wars and main online modes. We don't see them during the Turf War gameplay, but it would be great if the customization actually hinted at a greater purpose. With that, that's all we found from the reveal of Splatoon 3. We've only seen a small tease for the title, but I'm very excited for how it's shaping up. Here's hoping we learn more about the title sometime later this year. But what do you guys think? Find something that we didn't? Make sure to let us know your thoughts. Once again, I'd like to give a very special thanks to my friends TJ and PSI Kid T for helping me with this analysis. You can check them out down in the credits section of the description below. Thank you all so much for watching, and make sure to subscribe to Game Explain for plenty more on Splatoon 3 and other things gaming as well. Check out the videos on the right for more content you may be interested in. Until next time, farewell.